Thanks again, uh, Marcus, for being with us today for our first Urban AI conversation. So to present you quickly, you are currently leading the Urban Complexity Project at the ETH Future Cities Lab in Singapore. Uh, you received your PhD uh, at the UTH uh, of Zurich, and then you conducted some postdoctoral projects at the MIT Sensible City Lab and also the Santa Fe Institute. And actually, you uh, co-authored an article recently um, in which you discovered a fascinating law that you called the universal vi visitation law of human mo mobility. And uh, so, of course, you are going to tell us more about this law, but basically what you found is that uh, urban travel patterns um, are predictable regardless of location. And so maybe uh, if, if you want to tell us more, um, just to give some elements of context, we will have 20 minutes of, of presentation uh, on, this, uh, on this topic, and then we will have a 20 minute training session with uh, the online audience. Okay, that's great. <clears throat> yeah, so thank you very much, Hubert, for uh, having me here at the uh, Urban AI conversation. That's fantastic. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, I'm going to present the, uh, a little bit the paper that we have published in May. Let me just quickly share my screen. Hopefully it works. Yeah. Okay, can you see the slide? Okay, perfect. Yeah, so my name is Mark Schlepfer and as uh, Uber uh, already uh, said, I'm uh, um, I'm, I'm co-leading the uh, Urban Complexity Project at ETH Future Cities Laboratory, but I'm also a, a senior researcher at the University of Bern and an assistant adjunct assistant professor at the uh, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. So I have a few, few hats on. Um, okay, so but let's delve into this uh, paper, uh, the Universal Visitation Law of human mobility. And in this paper, we really quantify flows of people in a city. And just to start with, I would like to show a, um, a, a nice video. It's a time lapse of uh, New York. Um, let me see. Sorry, it's a bit noisy. Um, can you see that? So you can see all these people flowing. You can see people coming and going to different places. You see taxi drivers. Uh, that go there every day. There are also tourists coming here just once in a lifetime. New Yorkers that come here for shopping. So it's it's a very um, in, a very complicated mixture of of uh, motivations why people visit different places, and this gives rise to this flow that we observe. And it looks very uh, uh, complicated and 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 quite complex. But understanding such uh, population flows in cities is actually very important. So we need to try to quantify those and even try to predict those flows. And that would be important. First instance, but also for urban planning, urban, urban design. So if you want to foster the interactions of people uh, in public space, actually we would need to know where we wanna put a, a public space, like a public park, so as to attract people and attract a, 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 a sufficient amount of people. So we need to understand how much they are willing to travel to different locations. And also understanding those flows um, of people is very, very important also for uh, epi epidemic models, for instance, if we want better understand the spread of COVID and other uh, epidemic diseases. There are many other uh, important uh, aspects here, like if you want to place your business, you would like to know where's an ideal place, where do people travel often, and so on. So there's a clear need to understand those flows. And to understand them, we, we can ask very basic questions. So we can take a place or we can basically stand on such a public space like the Times Square that you may have seen before in New York. And we can stand there, we can just ask, okay, how many people visit this given location? From how far away do they come? So where, where do they live and from where do they visit? 
And also what's also very important is actually how often do they visit because this visitation frequency then determines the interaction of the different population groups of the people in public space, which is very important in terms uh, of the uh, cityness that you mentioned Uwe, um, before we started. It's about cities are about interactions and it's about bringing people together and how often they do so really determines actually the uh, interaction rate of, of people in, in, in space, which is then important for uh, the spread of trends and ideas, but also for the spread of diseases, for instance. And so these are very basic and fundamental questions, actually, but what's quite surprising, if you look at the literature, uh, the third question of how often do people visit a given place has so far actually been largely uh, neglected. So we, we, we have models, we, in the past we have had models uh, that allow us to uh, predict like the number of visitors coming from a given distance, like the, uh, the gravity law, and also in that sense, in some sense, the, uh, the radiation model, um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, 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 mobility models. But these models uh, really, they could not differentiate between people that visit like once per week uh, and those people that visit like every day, for instance. So the, the distribution basically of people according to their visitation frequency um, has remained uh, unclear so far. And this is a very important aspect, as, as, as I said before. And so one of the reasons uh, we suspect is that uh, to, to understand how often people visit the place, to understand this systematically, you need uh, good data. And this data um, has been around, but not so long. So this is certainly one of the reasons is like the data limitation. And one um, type of data where you can actually measure how often people visit a certain location is coming from mobile phone um, uh, records, basically. So everybody of us is carrying a mobile phone and these mobile phones, as we know, is basically, rec uh, is, is basically uh, 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 measuring where we are at which time. Now, we do not need to answer those questions in the aggregate, how, how many people are visiting, how often. We do not need to have the detailed trajectory of each individual. So we can anonymize, use anonymized data that are also spatially and temporally aggregated so that it's not very uh, sensitive re with respect to uh, data privacy. And so this is basically what we what we uh, what we have done. So we we had these uh, different uh, uh, data sets from mobile phone data, and I will come to that a little bit later. And now we can basically um, design, if you want, a very very simple uh, algorithm. Uh, <clears throat> So uh, basically you take a location like the, um, like the uh, Times Square in New York, which would be like the red square here in the middle, and then you just count. So you take a ring at the distance R, like let's say 10 kilometers, R is 10 kilometers, and you take a certain ring width, which could be like one kilometer or two kilometers, and you just count the number of people that are coming from this distance and are visiting once per month, for instance. And that would be these dark colored uh, symbols here, like three, three persons we would count here. And then we would do the same and we would, we would increase the uh, visitation frequency and we would ask how many uh, individuals would uh, visit two times per month, which would be two individuals in our case. We count the uh, number of people coming three times per month and so on. So that's basically the, the algorithm. And um, we change the frequency and we also change the distance. And this gives us the whole uh, distribution of visitors according to distance and frequency. And so we can start with a simple uh, example, which is uh, here Back Bay, or Back Bay West to be more precise in Boston. So that's a, uh, that's like a, a, sh a shopping area in Boston. And um, we basically start to make a diagram or a histogram 
And here on the uh, x-axis on the left side, we have the, uh, we have the distance r again, so r is the visitation distance. And on the y-axis, we have the number of visitors and we normalize that by the ring area. Because if you, if you take, for instance, the same ring width uh, of one kilometers, your area increases as you increase the distance. So we, what, we, what we count is the number of visitors per square kilometer of the origin. So how many people per square kilometer are visiting from one, 10 and 20 kilometers away? And here on the, the right side are just like the uh, important um, uh, notations here for the variables. So F is then the visitation frequency. So that would be visiting once, twice, or five times a month. R is the visitation distance, so from how far away. And Rho is our visitor density, so number of visitors per square kilometer as before. And now we start and we say, OK, we, we only look at one particular visitation frequency. So we just take those individuals that are visiting between once and twice uh, in four months. It's here in Boston. And we can just make this uh, little histogram here. And so what we, what we see uh, is a, a decrease in the number of visitors with increasing distance. So from about two to three kilometers away, we have about 200 visitors per square kilometer. And then if we increase the distance uh, to about um, 30 kilometers, we would have only like one person per square kilometer visiting with a frequency between one and two. Um, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, times in four months. And so this decrease in the number of visitors with distance is, uh, of course, is not very surprising. Um, yeah, so if you just ask in a location from how far away are you coming from, you would have less people coming from further away. And so this is uh, not very surprising because you need more time and more energy and more money to travel further. And so this is already well known uh, also in the uh, geography literature, for instance, presentation literature. And um, it's, it's usually captured by um, <clears throat> existing models such as the, the gravity law in transportation. So this is already known, basically, and we can do this now not only for frequency one, but we can uh, increase the frequency and do the same histograms again. And we see that for all these different uh, larger frequency, we also see like a clear decrease uh, of the number of visitors with distance. Okay, so... That's one thing, we uh, keep the frequency fixed and we analyze how the number of visitors changes with distance. But now with this detailed data at hand, we can do, uh, can do it the other way around. Uh, we can now keep the distance, uh, distance fixed and see uh, how the number of visitors changes actually if we increase the uh, visitation frequency. And that's here now on the uh, right hand side. So here right now on the x-axis, we have the uh, frequency, uh, <coughs> the uh, number of visits per period. So here it's four months. And what we can see here also that the number of visitors also decreases when we increase the visitation frequency. So if you go to a place generally, and just in general terms, uh, you would observe that uh, 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 frequent visitors are outnumbered by infrequent ones. So we have more infrequent visitors in total. And so this visit is, this data is very generic, right? So it basically includes people that visit this place for any purpose. So it could go be for, be it for shopping, for work, dropping off uh, your kids for school, uh, could be people that just visit uh, jewelry, it could be, uh, uh, you know, like as, um, <clears throat> a, a delivery of, of something. So it, it includes all activities here. And so what we, what, what's, what's, what's now interesting to see if you compare these two panels here on the left, here the left one with the right one, you see that the decrease in the number of visitors is, is very symmetric. 
right? I mean, there's a bit of fluctuation, statistical fluctuations going on. So it, it, there are slight differences, but in general, these two plots look very much uh, alike. And so what we can see is that the number of visitors decreases symmetrically in distance and frequency. So in other words, if we double the distance or if we double the frequency, we have the same decrease in the number of visitors. And that means that we can try to plot now uh, the number of visitors not against distance and frequency separately, but just against the product of distance and frequency. And this is in the next plot. And you can see that now these curves that we have seen before, they collapse uh, uh, onto one curve, basically. And so this curve has, uh, we can fit uh, um, <clears throat> a line here. And what we get is a, 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 a power law with exponent that is around two. And so what we have done here is basically we have reduced uh, the dimensionality. So before we had the number of visitors as a function of distance and frequency separately. And now we see that the number of visitors is actually a function of the product of distance times frequency. And this also makes in a way sense because whether you double the distance or whether you double the frequency, the travel distance or the travel effort that people need to make is the same, right? So whether you visit uh, once a week from 10 kilometers away or twice a week from five kilometers away, your travel total travel distance per week remains the same, right? So if the travel effort is the is the uh, is the uh, driving factor or the important factor here, then it makes sense that the number of visitors is a function of the product of distance and frequency. And so this is just for a uh, back bay here in Boston. Um, but it, what we what we what we found is that this is also valid for many other or almost all other locations in the greater uh, Boston area. Um, here at thousands of locations, and you can see um, that it doesn't really matter where you are. Of course, there are deviations; it's it's very clear. But in general, this basic law is uh, 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 quite valid for most of the locations. And so now you can ask, okay, could that be, it's, it's, it's in the US, you have like a certain mode of transportation, people are using a lot of their cars, how does it look in Europe? And so we also had data from Portugal and uh, we, we could see that it's this, this law, basically this inverse square law also holds in Portugal. So the blue line is always the uh, inverse square with slope uh, minus two. And it's also valid in, uh, in, uh, in, in Dakar, in, in Senegal, and also in, in Ivory Coast, in, in Abidjan, and it's also valid in, in Singapore. So these are those uh, different uh, urban areas that we are we, we tested so in very different uh, uh, um, uh, socioeconomic settings so there's something very generic uh, going on here um, okay so so basically what, what you can do is we can uh, overlay all these different locations and and um, uh, in, in, onto a single curve by normalizing them by the different uh, attractiveness values. So of course, um, maybe just to clarify, um, if we go back, um, the, the slope is the same, but not the magnitude of the flows, right? So of course you have more visitors in, in a city center than in a, in a more rural area. So that's clear. And, and that's basically reflected in the, uh, in the, in the intercept. So in the, in the magnitude um, of the flows. And um, yeah, so all this curve then collapse. If we normalize those curves by the magnitude, then these curves collapse onto a single curve, which uh, have about um, a, a slope of, of a minus two. So it's a power law with exponent uh, two. <clears throat> and uh, what that means that if we double the distance or if we double the visitation frequency, the number of visitors always decreases by a factor of four. 
right? So you can just put like a two in your formula down two times R or two times F to the square gives you a four. So doubling distance or doubling frequency, uh, the number of uh, visitors decreases by a factor of four. And so um, what's location specific, as I said, is the magnitude and that's here denoted by this mu i. So i is the index of the location and i mu i would then be like the attractiveness of the location and we can then um, plot these attractiveness values um, in space basically and we see um, these uh, arrangements of, of centers and subcenters here in the uh, greater Boston area. Um, we can do a, 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 a we can analyze the distribution um, of those clusters. And what we see is that the uh, the size that the rank size distribution of those clusters follows um, very much Zipf's law, which is like a well known distribution of the of, of city sizes in, in in human geography. So what we have seen is so far is okay. We have this uh, this inverse square law. And we have this spatial clustering of uh, attractive locations. And what we did is we, we re related these uh, observations to um, well-known models of individual uh, human mobility. So um, individual human mobility has been uh, researched um, uh, quite intensively during the last years, also thanks to the uh, availability of, of, of new types of data, including mobile phone data. So from an individual perspective, um, it is quite well known how far we go and how often we go uh, which distance. And this behavior of individuals has been uh, captured um, quite well so far by the, um, by the uh, popular exploration and preferential return model uh, by a song at alter sorry i think it was introduced 2010 around and so it what it does it basically it shows how um, that people uh, explore new locations with a certain probability uh, or they return to an already visited uh, location and if they uh, explore a new location they um, uh, jump a distance that is power law distributed. And so this is basically a model, and we extended this model uh, by um, um, including the fact that people tend to go to popular places already. So this is why we called it uh, preferential exploration and preferential return model. And so with this extension of the model, we uh, were able to reproduce. Uh, so, so basically, you you um, you uh, apply these rules to every uh, agent, and you do basically uh, an agent-based model. You let it run on a lattice, and what we see are, uh, is that we can really reproduce these uh, basic observations uh, that we have seen before. So we can reproduce. Uh, this collapse of the data onto a single curve with slope uh, two or minus two, uh, this inverse square law, but we can also uh, reproduce uh, the spatial clustering of popular uh, locations and that the, uh, the uh, rank size distribution of this popular location again follows uh, closely Zipf's law as we have seen uh, before. So that's our individual based uh, human mobility model that reproduces all these results that we have seen before. And what we can do uh, is we can also, so just to show you actually the, um, the, the, the value added of, 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 uh, uh, of, 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 of our uh, model or of our uh, consideration of the frequency, we compared our model to uh, existing uh, mobility models, which is the gravity model and the radiation model, gravity model in red and radiation model in blue. And um, <clears throat> these uh, numbers you can see here, they give you basically the uh, goodness of the, of the uh, prediction with these different models. 
So we can use uh, our law to predict flows in cities. And so here, this is Back Bay Boston again as an example. And uh, we can see that our uh, predictions uh, outperform those of the radiation model and the classic gravity model. But what's um, <clears throat> more in, in terms of the total number of trips, so we are measure, so we are predicting number of trips between uh, two locations here. And so again, so we can predict number of trips, the gravity model can do that as well, but the gravity model is not able to break down this number of trips into individuals, right? So if you have, let's say, 100, trip, 100 trips between um, a rural town and the city center, you have 100 trips in a week, you don't know whether it's, uh, you know, like whether it's um, uh, 50 people doing twi going twice there a week or whether it's 10 people going 10 times, you don't know. And, and with our, um, with this um, inverse square law that we have this covered, we can actually break this down into how many individuals are actually behind those trips. <clears throat> And so we can go further and we can say, okay, how many individuals then uh, uh, visit um, or high frequency visitors and how many individuals are low frequency visitors. So we can basically predict the whole spectrum um, of visitors to a given location, which is then of course important for um, disease modeling um, and so on. And so this is for Back Bay Boston, of course, it's only an illustrative example, and we did this uh, in a more uh, systematic way. Uh, so here in this plot here on the right, um, like the um, <clears throat> letters down here, it means trips, and um, we, name, we mean, means uh, visitors, and H means high frequency visitors, and L means low frequency visitors. And we fitted the gravity law to the number of trips and this fit parameters, we cannot use them to the predict the number of uh, individuals uh, visiting. So that would require a new fitting procedure. I don't know whether it goes a bit too much into the technical details here right now. Yeah, so this is, um, uh, these are the main findings and as you said at the beginning um, there was a nice visualization also um, done for this project so that was done by uh, the sensible city lab mostly based on, based on the data and I'm just showing uh, the video because it just uh, I think it's it's very it's very beautiful and it's quite um, or um, it's quite or, or artistic um, if you want and so uh, yeah so you can you can watch it on the um, on YouTube or also on the uh, on the uh, sensible uh, city lab website you can also play around a little bit um, yeah and uh, yeah, it has so on the web, you can see it as nice uh, music also. And you can really see like these flows going to the different locations and then the emergence of these different centers and sub centers based on the uh, number of visitors there, visiting distance and uh, <clears throat> visiting frequency. Yeah, thank you. I would like to stop here. I think, um, yeah, I think the time is more or less up. It's about 20 minutes. I mean, there's much more to say to that. So it's also has a lot of connection to uh, human geography, but I think it is, um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's, so we have a lot of time for discussions and um, it depends on, on your interest also, of course. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, Marcus, for your presentation. Uh, so yes, now we'll have a kind of training session with the audience. So if you have any questions uh, or that you need further information, feel free to open your micro and directly uh, ask your question. Uh, just before I, I have myself a, a question concerning your, your paper, Marcus, you wrote that um, your finding, your law, uh, have, have also an impact on the central place theory. Right. Uh, could you, because it's also an important theory, could you first remind this theory 
and then explain us uh, why is it related to to it yes so that's that's a, a, a great question because it really brings us into the realms of, of human geography so central player place theory uh, basically i mean it's not really a theory but it basically says that you that we have a hierarchy uh, of centers and sub centers so it was it was developed for more like towns and rural towns and cities but it also applies to can also be applied to uh, intra-city uh, movement. So the idea is that we have a, a, a hierarchy of centers and sub-centers. So we have like a local uh, in your neighborhood. We have like a local um, a little uh, little center, like a little shop, like a grocery store or a bakery, right? So there you go uh, every day maybe like to buy your bread for instance right and then you have a more like a, a more like a, a regional center uh, or district center perhaps uh, in a city where you have like a bigger shopping mall already right where you have more specialized functions that go now beyond this grocery store and the bakery but where you can basically uh, buy more specialized things you know like um, for food for instance or uh, uh, you can buy plants or, or whatever, or computers maybe. And then there's a, the higher order center um, where uh, you have even more specialized uh, goods and services, which the classic example could be like a jewelry where people uh, travel quite far, quite large distances, but they go there uh, very infrequently, right? So you go there like, uh, I don't know, like, twice uh, in a lifetime for instance right? and so on and so on and so go. you can go to the uh, new york times square which is very high up in the hierarchy uh, where people travel um, through the world basically uh, just to visit maybe like once in a lifetime right and so um, th that's basically central place theory so you have this this hierarchy of services and goods and uh, the, this the levels of this hierarchy they the idea, the idea is that the levels of this hierarchy are reflected by the visitation frequency, right? And so um, that was actually the central place theory was the very start and very motivation of this paper, actually, because it was really like, how, how do you measure this hierarchy inside a city? Uh, it, it was, you know, it was quite obvious that we measure it through the frequency because I had like, when I was like in Boston, I had like my local 7-Eleven. So 7-Elevens, I would go there like, I don't know, like three times a week and then would go to the center of, of, of Boston maybe once a week and so on. So I can, I can describe the hierarchical level with both the frequency and the distance of this visitor. So that was the starting point and very uh, motivation of that. And uh, yes, so you can you can reflect it with, with these two parameters, right? And we see also that on average of, I mean, it makes also sense on average, we have like a, 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 an increase of travel distance with a decrease of frequency. There's, there's a clear uh, relation there. So yes, so that's, that's really opening up um now a quantification basically of the uh, central place theory uh, for the intracity organization and um yeah so it, it's really about how far are people willing to travel for a given frequency which reflects a given good and so this interplay of these different locations and placements of, of or, or the place of these different locations it gives really rise to these flows. I think that's really um, important. I think it really um, <clears throat> it really should open up also the possibility to develop now uh, better quantitative models for the intra-city urban organization. Yeah, and it so yeah, so it makes really um, a sense if you see it that you you shouldn't place your shopping mall outside a city, right? Because then it really triggers much more flow than you ac actually expect, and yeah, so it might not work at the very end. Thank you. And could you just stop sharing your your screen? Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. So. Laura, I think you have a question. You raise your hand or no? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, th thank you very much for the for, for that presentation. It's really, really interesting. Um, and I can relate a lot. Uh, I was about to ask not necessarily about the, um, the central place theory, but it remind, I'm more familiar with uh, the, the central place theory, yes, but I'm more familiar with the bid rent theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and the bid rent theory is precisely of the relationship of how individuals are willing to travel mm -hmm. for a trade off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that relates to if it's a central place or not, mm -hmm, etc. Mm -hmm, et mm -hmm. So uh, I was wondering what sort of that that's my first first question. If you thought of any impact in relation to that, because you you are defining the the frequency, but also the distance. And one of the things that you say distance traveled, and I'm sort of wondering, are did you consider only the distance, or are there any factors like travel modes so if it's obviously walking distances or if it's longer distances because sometimes you talk about you know square kilometers and you so you're talking about at the hierarchy of centers as opposed if you do it more in a proximity levels or or, or more at, at a micro scale so i guess what i'm trying to ask is is are there any factors considering, or that could be considered probably as a next step, maybe, uh, from your paper, that this distance, is it defined depending on the travel modes? That's one. And um, and the other one, I'm assuming that this, we're not talking about Euclidean distances, but network distances. Um, and that's something that I, I actually did really further in my in my PhD research mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the types of distances traveled in a network distance that could be precisely on the bid rent. So um, I, I'm really fascinated that the, your actual paper. So I, it kind of just strikes me those questions if this is kind of, you know, your next steps uh, or possible research or what do you think yes. could be could be an impact? Yes, absolutely. So with the more like urban economics model in general, um, I, th I think, uh, yeah, so I think they, they can be really extended right now to take like the frequency component uh, into account. So it, it's really like if you double the frequency, what you do is basically you double your distance traveled per time, right? And so that's probably the, the right variable uh, to look at also in, in, but the thing is, in, in, in urban economics, like many, many models or most models so far, they look at work and, and, and where you live and where you work. But what we do here is we, we include all types of activities, right? And so these this types of activities you, you take into account in your, in your daily life and also in your decision, perhaps in where you wanna live. So th these economic models, they have to be broadened up in my view and, and really include this, this this intrinsic willingness basically to spend time and energy for different types of activities that are at different levels of this urban hierarchy. Um, so that's one. And the other one, yeah, of course, uh, with the um, travel modes and travel time and network distance, yeah, that would be certainly a, a, a logical next step to do is to, to further improve uh, also the pred predictions uh, of our of our model um, yeah so because you know I mean there are of course uh, fluctuations around these curves and um, we also had to bin the data we had to average also because of the um, 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 uh, of the sparsity of the data especially if you if you um, uh, get to larger distances so yeah so uh, so um, to, uh, to, to assess this deviation. So, so one thing would be to have even better data. And the other thing is to, uh, yeah, so to extend really the, the, the model by the impact of the, uh, of the travel time basically to different locations. So it's just like a first baseline uh, result that we that we have here right it just it, it the idea is really to open it up to the time dimension to the frequency dimension and the distance you travel effectively per time so that was that's that's the idea and so the you know and 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 the, the law was so so robust at least in in, in our findings that we 
yeah, so that we didn't go further with, with travel time and could look at travel time. I think one could, um, from the mobile phone data, it should be possible to, to get an indication on travel times also, of course. Yeah. I, I, and it was I, I, averaged I, over the whole ring. Yeah. You know, and, uh, that's, that's I, I think it has a lot of potential. I mean, if you do pursue it further, because, you know, now more than ever, you're talking about flows. Yeah. Um, and it, it becomes so important now, the, the cost of travel. And by cost, I don't mean in, in terms of economic, I, I mean in terms of every individual needs to travel and to use a certain mode. So I think it's super interesting for, for mm -hmm. that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, go, go on, Nikita. Yeah. Yeah, uh, hi everyone. I'm Nikita. Today I'm substituting Katya from Heavy Datum, uh, a new member of Urban AI community. And thank you for the presentation, Marcus. Uh, I have a question about the definition of origin in your studies. So, mm -hmm. uh, well, home is definitely one of the most common origins for travel, especially during COVID. But in our real life, we sometimes go somewhere to a bar from work mm -hmm. from home. So were you, do you think that if we will define origin as something else, for example, as a real origin of where you're coming from, be that workplace or something even more transient, like a place where you stayed for a couple of hours, the pattern will keep the same or it will change because it's a different process? And are you looking to explore this part of origin definitions yeah yeah that's also a very good question yeah so um yeah so there are studies around of what's the percentage of trips you make that are start from home versus those that are start from other locations and it's uh, so as far as i know uh, the paper um, i i think we even cited it uh, we we know is that the the at least the majority is 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 starting from home actually so uh, from from also has been derived on questionnaire based data um, so the um, model we did the individual based model you can set it up in different ways and there you can also set it up that you know like the, the next jump is basically not necessarily your home and you measure that and you you still get this inverse square so it looks like uh, it would also hold if you define the origin location differently but this, this is something one would need to look at, at more deep, of course so i cannot say that mm. thank you Thank you for the question. Actually, I have a I have another question, uh, Marcus. I was wondering, like, how concretely uh, could we use this law? Like, for example, uh, an entrepreneur, because I know that we have some entrepreneurs with uh, with us today, or an urban planner, or. Uh, uh, public stakeholders could concretely use this law to create better cities. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, so it's really you can really use it um, to to place uh, amenities, for instance, like uh, I, I mentioned, like public parks, for instance. Uh, because it gives you some guideline actually of, of how far people are willing to travel with which frequency. And that gives you an indication of how often people from different areas of the city would be willing to, to travel to this given location. So at least it gives you as a, a, an initial idea or a, an initial a rough prediction, right? So if you, at least if you compare it to what we have before, it gives you like a, a richer picture basically of, of how often different people are um, uh, visiting from different locations. And uh, yeah, so that could really, as an urban planner, for instance, that could really help you uh, in the placement of, of uh, public spaces when you're really interested in fostering you know like the interactions uh, of people so in singapore they do it very uh, intentionally right so it's it's really like really to to increase the social cohesion and really increase the uh, the interactions between different population groups from different area of the city 
and um, to to optimize basically these interactions this law could could certainly help as a, at least as a, as a baseline thank you yes uh, Antoine uh, yes go, go on please Yes, thank you. Um, hey, thank you, Marcus, for the presentation to and <coughs> Brian for organizing the, um, the session. It's really interesting. I'm, I'm working for BlaBlaCar, the, the car pooling company, and, and more precisely, the BlaBlaCar Daily, which is a, an app that is doing car pooling for uh, home uh, work uh, carpool, so going to work mm -hmm. uh, and coming back uh, using carpool. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering in your model, did you take into account how uh, seasonality, so how much uh, frequency of, of visiting depends on whether it's the weekend or the week? Because I would think that during the week, for example, frequent users are actually commuters, whereas during the weekend, it might be more uh, traveling for, for leisure. Uh, so I was wondering how much the new model depends on the, the day of the week or the, the, the summer or the winter and so on. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's also a good question. I mean, we didn't, go so much into detail, but uh, we looked at different uh, days of the week also. And what it appears is that, you know, there are, we, we can see slight signals in, in the frequency of visitors on, on a Sunday. Uh, but in, in general, it seems to hold quite well. Of course, what changes is again, this magnitude of the flow of the mm -hmm. flow, right? So if you if you look at the uh, at Back Bay in Boston or, or maybe like a better example is maybe like a, a shop at the, the, the Central Business District in Singapore, you really have less visitors obviously during the weekend because in, in the Central Business District, people work there. Um, so we can see like certainly a change in, in the magnitude and we can also see changes in the in the distribution of the of the of the of the, of the frequency but we did not uh, assess that in a, in a systematic way this is certainly something that depends also on the location what's what's really there right I mean if you have um, a certain uh, points of interest or amenities that, that are able to attract people on the weekend. So that's that, that's something that would need to be looked at into more detail. And this is something where, for instance, machine learning could also come in basically to identify all those different factors actually that determine the deviations from this law. So okay. yeah, so yeah. Thank you. Hmm? I don't know if, he, if we have uh, other questions. Well, we, we already uh, uh, are at the end of the session. Um, so if we do not have uh, other questions, actually, even if you have other questions, just uh, send me an email or directly send an email to, to Marcus, actually. It will Absolutely, be, yeah. <laughs> it will be easier. So thanks a lot, uh, Marcus, uh, for this presentation and for answering uh, all our questions. It was really great to have you. It was super insightful. And uh, so this presentation will be soon available on YouTube and we will have another Urban AI conversation in two weeks. And this time it will be about AI localism, a concept coined by Stéphane Verrust uh, from the uh, New York University. And we'll try to uh, analyze, he will uh, analyze uh, 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 data governance uh, topics. So uh, thanks again, uh, Marcus and everyone for being with us uh, today and see you soon. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much for listening to it. And uh, yeah, thank you very much for having me and uh, yeah, have a great evening. <laughs>